Hey folks, this is Steve Vai, and you're watching Life Minute TV. Virtuoso guitarist, composer, and producer Steve Vai is considered by many as one of the greatest guitarists of all time. Throughout his 40-year career, he sold more than 15 million records, received three Grammy Awards, and is recorded with so many music greats. His most recent studio album, Inviolet, is out now. This is a Life Minute with Steve Vai. Like many artists, before the pandemic, I was working on something, and it was going to be the third installment of a trilogy of records that I've been working on for years called Real Illusions. Uh, but it's a big project, and it required all sorts of um, people coming in and everything. But once you know, you woke up and everything was locked down, musicians had to kind of figure out different ways to communicate and continue their livelihood. And they did, because we're a very resilient bunch. Uh, so I used the lockdown time pretty constructively. You know, I kind of shifted gears. It was kind of nice in a way to have everything just taken away in a sense, you know? So you're, you're left with this open space. And of course, it was very challenging for some people, you know? Uh, but for some people, they thrived. And I, I was fortunate in that I'm one of those people that really thrived through the lockdown because, uh, because the only thing that ever gets in the way of your brutal creativity is interruptions. And I didn't have many, so I was able to really focus. So I, I wanted to supply the fans with um, things from you know, the studio uh, via all the wonderful uh, ways that we have to share things through Instagram, YouTube, you know, all the socials. So the first thing I did was I started a speaking series, these live streams, uh, two series. One was called Alien Guitar Secrets. Uh, I did episode one through eight, and it's great for guitar players and, you know, people who are interested in their, how to, how to evolve their career perhaps, or, you know, kind of creative things and, you know, the questions I get from guitar players that um, I can help with. Uh, and then another series was called Under It All, and that was more of a reflection of my um, appreciation and my, my study of spiritual literature, which I've been doing my whole life. So it's a little more esoteric, but they, they, they were really good. The response to them was fantastic, and I felt nice that it was able, I was able to contribute something to people interested in what I do that are trapped at home, you know? So then there was uh, s certain like guitar techniques and things that I, I had in the back of my mind that I wanted to explore that required a lot of time. So I started um, working on one of them. It was a song called Candle Power and I wanted to do it so I could make a home video in the studio to send out and I did and it was, it, it was really well received. Had some kind of peculiar playing in it. And then I, uh, I did something I'd never done I released a solo acoustic vocal version of one of my songs. I just put on the camera and I never did that before, for the public at least. And it was a song called The Moon and I. There is a love affair between the moon and I. It was really well received. I was surprised. So I started to engage in something that uh, I always wanted to do and I had on the shelf as a fantasy, which was uh, make a solo acoustic vocal record where I sing. Um, I have a collection of uh, songs and ideas I've been waiting to do that with. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm not known for doing that kind of thing, and uh, I'm not even known very well to sing, uh, but I love singing. I like my voice uh, in certain contexts, you know, and it's very limited. It's not rock and roll at all. But um, it works nice in some things. So I started recording this record, and then halfway through it, I, uh, I had to get shoulder surgery because of, I don't know, 50 years of abuse, you know, sitting like this and throwing guitars. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it was pretty bad, you know, my shoulder was hanging up. But uh, it got fixed, and it was great. But it takes like a year to heal. So during that, when I got out of the surgery, this was still kind of lockdown stuff. I was in a sling, and the sling was called a knapsack because the doctor that designed it specifically for this kind of thing, his name was Dr. Knapp, and he was my surgeon. 
And so I got home and I, I picked up a guitar and I was like, hey, wait a minute, I can still play. So I thought, I'm gonna write a song with one hand. Um, it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> the mother of invention is necessity or whatever. You know. And uh, I did that and uh, I called the song Knapsack and it was another one of those things that just, you know. So I started to realize I was, uh, accumulating pieces for a, a different kind of a record than the one I set out before the pandemic. And it was weird because, you know, usually through my whole career, it's like, you, you know, you make records, you tour, you make a record, you tour, and everything uh, falls into place relatively well. Uh, when it's time to tour, I'm eager to tour, but when I'm not and I'm in the studio, I don't want to tour, I want to be in the studio. But something weird happened where I got this this impulse, I just wanted a tour. I wanted to get out on tour. I didn't realize how much in my blood that was, you know? Because it was like, wait a minute, I want to go on tour, you know? <laughs> so I felt that, the, you know, right at that point, I felt that the important thing to do was to finish an instrumental guitar record. And this turned into inviolate. So the word inviolate, I, I had come across that. It's a beautiful word. And um, I'd come across it in the spiritual studies. Yeah. And um, it basically is in reference to, uh, what, what it means is um, unable to harm, I, I, incapable of, of, of violating or changing. So something that's inviolate is unchangeable. It's, uh, it's infinite, it's endurable, it, you know can't be touched. And it's usually used in reference to the human spirit, their consciousness, their awareness. So I like that. And I thought it was a beautiful word and I wanted to use it somewhere. And I thought, ah, that's a great name for the record. So as I was starting to see this record taking shape, I started to pull some little ideas that I had that I knew had the DNA in them of some uh, songs that would very much me, you know, and uh, one of the songs that I was able to finally approach is a song called, that I later ended up calling Teeth of the Hydra. Okay, Teeth of the Hydra, uh, and I perform it on this peculiar looking triple neck guitar called the Hydra. <laughs> and the story behind that is basically started when I first saw Jimmy Page with a double neck, you know. Uh, I had a fascination for multi-necked instruments. And I always kind of thought this, a lot you can probably do with that. So through the years, I've developed all sorts of multi-necked instruments. One of, the, one of the more popular ones was the big heart-shaped guitar, triple neck weird thing that I used in a David Lee Roth video, just like Paradise. Uh, but you know, that guitar was basically built as a prop for the video, you know? And that always kind of bugged me because I didn't do anything with it. It was the prop. So I kind of felt like a chump, you know? <laughs> so I thought, well, you gotta do something with it. So I wrote a song called Fever Dream, which was on my Ultrazone record. And it's kind of interesting because I incorporate the other necks, but still um, it didn't scratch a particular itch that was sitting in the back of my head. And then one day, um, the inspiration just came, and this was about seven years ago, and it just came completely compact, and if I was to unpack it and speak what the inspiration sounded like, it might sound something like this. Uh, you're going to write a lovely piece of music on an instrument that will carry the entire song. So you're gonna need bass neck, seven string, tuned down to A, nice and heavy, 12 string, harp strings, I wanted a guitar synthesizer, piezos, sample and hold, uh, uh, sustainers, all of these kinds of things that uh, you can just put on a wish list, you know? And I'm so lucky, I work with this uh, company Ibanez, they'll, they'll make anything that's possible for me, you know? Um, so, in my mind's eye, I saw myself wielding this thing in a way that was seamless, elegant, fascinating, engaging, entertaining, melodically beautiful, um, and uh, quasi-unbelievable. 
So that's, I set out to do that. You can do that. In your own mind, all you have to do is make that demand. And then it has to happen, because that's what you're here for. So, <laughs> so I, uh, I saw this in my head. I didn't know what the guitar was going to look like. I didn't know what the song was going to be, but I knew that the song had to have a, a, a good melody, or at least you know, the best melody I could write. So I, I took some examples of some things and I included them in that email. And then I hit send and it went to the guys at uh, Ibanez and they just sharpened their knives and started carving. And it took about four years, back and forth, back and forth. And then um, finally they came to the home with a, a cardboard cutout of the Hydra. And th this is um, very helpful in the creation because I knew I had to play it. You just, you never know until you have it, you know? So the cardboard cutout was helpful, but then they made a uh, prototype. So I actually have a prototype Hydra. I call it the Hyena. It's ugly as sin. It's not finished, you know? And, and this was very valuable in kind of like trying to play it and see uh, elements that could cause a lot of problems. Like, you know, the next, that they needed to go a little bit more. Uh, the harp strings were like this. I kept hitting them. They had to be moved here. You know, the, the, so you, you, you kind of go through that process. And then maybe a, a year or so after that, the Hydra appeared at my house. And I opened it up. It, I didn't have a name for it. We were just calling it the steampunk guitar. You know, and I opened it up and I looked at it and I, I was stunned. Uh, it, it was fascinating and I was terrified too because I knew I had to write a piece of music on this thing. Uh, and that's when I said, that's the Hydra. So Hydra is a mythical uh, dragon-like creature, you know, and, uh, from Greek mythology. And I thought that was a great name. And then I thought, because of my fascination for old claymation movies like Clash of the Titans and Jason and the Argonauts and the Seven Voyages of Sinbad, oh boy, I love that stuff when I was a kid. When I was writing the song, I came up with the title first because I had the Hydra and I called the song Teeth of the Hydra, which is part of this movie, uh, I think it's Jason and the Argonauts, where they take the teeth from the Hydra and they plant them, and then the children of the Hydra come up and start trying to attack these guys. So the Hydra stood on a stand in my studio for about a year, because I was working on Inviolet, and I had just finished that surgery, and I, I, I didn't know how I was gonna negotiate this thing, you know? And, um, Halfway through the making of Inviolet, I actually suffered another shoulder injury and had to get another surgery. Uh, but that, it's fine. It wasn't that, that one wasn't that bad. But I, and I've tried all the holistics. It gets to a point where you just got to get it fixed. And, uh, and I did. But I didn't until I decided not to until I finished the record because I didn't know if I'd be able to play the Hydra at all if I, you know. So, I decided I, at the end of the project, I carved out six weeks and I sat behind the Hydra and I just thought, what were you thinking by? <laughs> when you, <laughs> you made this instrument, everybody, you know, you make an instrument like that and you put it out, well, Ibanez made it, we did it, and, you know, but um, you put it out there and, you know, I was seeing some of the press and some people feel like, well, sure, it's Steve Vai, he can make any kind of weird thing he wants, but what are you going to do with it? So I, I knew uh, I'm not going to be a chump, you know, I got it. I'm going to do something with it. That was the whole point. And um, I, well, I sat behind this thing and I thought, OK, Big Mouth, you know, what, what are you going to do? You, what, how are you even going to, you know? And then I just knew I could do it. I didn't know what it was, but I, you know, I said, shut up and just do it. So I just started and I started doing press and people were listening to the song and uh, you know the press would say oh the, the, the song Teeth of the Hydra T tell us about it well so I, I wrote it and recorded it on this guitar oh cool and I'm, I have to say well no I I'm actually everything you hear on this track with the exception of the keyboards and the drums is all the Hydra oh cool no this it's happening in one performance Oh, so then I'd show them the video of like when I was in the studio just working it out and getting it and then they go, oh. So I knew that I needed to make a video because that's where you can see it working and you can also be, if you're into that kind of thing, you can be thoroughly entertained. So then I uh, 
shot the video, and it was really difficult to uh, stand up with the Hydra and play it because it, it has a waist strap, so all the weight's on your legs and it's heavy. So you can't move or else it'll just take you over, you know? So um, we shot the video, and two days after the video, I had the second surgery. So it takes like a year to heal, you know? And I, I couldn't even get my arm over the thing. And, uh, but I had a European tour scheduled. That's why I moved the American tour. And I went to, we went to Europe, and um, I couldn't bring the Hydra, which was a shame. Uh, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to play it again because the last time I played it was when we shot the video almost a year ago. And uh, I had two weeks before this tour to get the Hydra under my hands. So I knew either I was going to start and know that I was going to be able to do it, or I was going to start and know that it's too early. But here I am, and I'm kicking ass with the Hydra on stage. I love it. It is so much fun. And kicking butt he is at 62, Vi says he's become more comfortable in his own skin. And his playing has evolved over the years. And fans expect when they see him live. When that happens, your, your creativity expands. There's a different dimension in the performance, you know, in the playing. There's a, I've all, I have always strived to be more deeply connected with the notes and the, you know, the instrument and the notes and the audience. And there's no end to how, to how much you can evolve that. And the more you evolve that, the more engaging the performance is. So you ask, what can my fans expect? They can expect that. A little, little, little more of an evolved performance, I think. I don't run around as much or any of that, but uh, there's a, there's a deeper connection with the notes. I was four years old and I, I walked up to a piano and I hit a note and I noticed to the right they go higher and to the left they go lower. And I had an epiphany. I had two epiphanies at that moment, four years old. Uh, one of them was just the construction of music. I, I seem to understand. And I, think, I don't think this is something uncommon for people who have a musical um, tendency. You know, when they come, pe people come into the world with all sorts of different uh, sort of understandings of things and interests and, and tools, you know. My tools were so weak <laughs> in so many academic things, you know. But uh, when I hit that note on the piano, it, it was like, oh, that's what home is, you know. So I, I could just, anything I heard, I just, I could kind of, imagine its structure. So composition was the first thing. The, the second little epiphany I had in that same moment was the creation of music is infinite and it's within you and this is something you can do. It's there already. It's already there. I didn't, I, it, it's hard to verbalize these kinds of because they didn't, maybe didn't sound like that in my head. There was no voice in my head. There was just a recognition. I can do this. I love this. I get it. And then I pooped my pants. <laughs> so there's the evidence that it was right. So anyway, uh, all, then through the years up to probably, you know, like all good Italian boys from Long Island, I played the accordion at eight, nine, and ten, a Rivaderci Roma, you know, but I could also play Smoke on the Water on the accordion. But the accordion uh, was nice for me because it helped me to really understand more about the little black dots. So I started composing, right, just doodling. And then I would try to play things that I was writing. So this was, at that age, I wasn't thinking about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I just liked music. And then, um, and that never went away. So um, then when I was, also, like six, I saw a kid playing the guitar, and uh, he was nine. And when I saw that, I ended up uh, falling in love with the instrument, you know? And, uh, but I didn't pick it up, I didn't decide, you know, I didn't make an executive decision to pick it up and start playing until I was 12, when my sister came home with Led Zeppelin. Uh, that was it. <clears throat> so, I never really decided to be a musician. I don't remember a time 
where I had to make a choice because I never felt it was a choice. I couldn't really do anything else. I was not, I was a very, very average, if not under average student in school. Um, kind of good at sports and really good at math, but uh, music, well, I, I, was, I was the boss. And it was great, and I've composed all through the years, and I've toured, and I've made records, and it's really good. One of his early mentors is still one of his besties today, Joe Satriani. I, I can't even fathom what my life would be like without him. Uh, when I was 12, a friend of mine, John Sergio, who's coming to the show tonight, who was a, a, a friend when I, you know, in diapers, you know, was, was also a great mentor because he introduced me to all this music that I was unaware of. Progressive rock from the 70s. He brought me to my first Queen concert. He brought me into his band. It was the first band I was in when I was 13. He's been a dear friend, incredible musical taste, you know, and uh, he was playing the guitar when I was 12, and I couldn't believe it, because he lived two houses away, and then, uh, he said, if you think I'm great, you should see my guitar teacher, Joe Satriani. So he gave me Joe's number, and I started taking lessons, and my lessons with Joe were, were all that mattered to me. Joe was always cool. He was always solid, sharing, and strict. And it was the best thing, because he was great. And that's what you want in a teacher, you know? You, you're inspired by seeing, and, and to this day, the thing that I got most there's so many things. And, and we're so fortunate that through, all through these years we've been joined at the hips. When I would watch him play, when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, this close, everything he touched on the instrument sounded like music. You know, when it came out of his fingers, it just sounded good. It sounded like there was a, there was a soul in it. It wasn't just like noodly nothingness, uh, the kind of academic exercises and stuff like that. I mean, we did some of that. That's part of the training. But even then, Joe can go, do 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 do, and it sounds like music. So I always, I always appreciated that. And still, he's he's so solid, and he's so musical. His inner musical ear is inspired that he's continued to be an inspiration my whole life. I kind of woke up as a teenager in the 70s to popular music. Before that, I was really into top 40, and still was through the 70s. Used to take my lunch money, shoot pool, win more money, and go buy 45s. But then when, the, when my sister came home with Led Zeppelin, that was a shocker and a stunner. Before that, it was uh, the music of West Side Story because I was very young and my parents brought that into the house. But then, you know, you, you get inspired by the things that your brothers and sisters and parents bring home. So I was hearing things like Alice Cooper, uh, Creedence Clear Water Revival, Sly and the Family Stone, Elton John, big, big on that. And, and all those things became really important to me. And then, uh, and Led Zeppelin was the top of the list. And then when I reemerged from my home again and started going on the street and started hanging out with John Sergio, uh, that, that's when the floodgates opened. You know, that's when Queen, Jethro Tull, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Yes, uh, all these kinds of cool progressive bands. Uh, but guitar players, for me, it was Jimmy Page in the beginning. And then, because uh, it was all I knew really. And then, of course, Hendrix, Jeff Beck, Brian May, Richie Blackmore, all, all the kind of rock 70s guys. And, and then I, soon after that, I uh, started to pick up like Al Dimiola. When I discovered Al and Return to Forever, that was huge. John McLaughlin, um, Carlos Santana, you know, uh, that, that song Earth's Cry, Heaven's Smile was a milestone for me. And, uh, but then came Alan Holdsworth. And that was a game changer, because he is ju was just a, a, a genius beyond. They'll be studying him in the future, not any of us. <laughs> and um, uh, that worked really well. And it continues to grow, because I love the guitar. I love seeing the different evolutions of players come along uh, to this day.
And then, of course, there was Frank Zappa. There was this kid that discovered sort of intuitively compositional music. But then there was the kid that discovered the coolness of rock guitar. Nobody was merging these things together. You know, nobody was really merging composition with coolness, so to speak. Uh, so that when I discovered Frank, when I was like 14, he was doing it. He was doing so many of the things that I just loved. He was writing music, it was compositional, there was blues, there was rock, there was jazz, it had everything in it. There was comedy, there was intense guitar playing. And um, I, just, I just became enamored with Frank, you know? I actually got his phone number um, and had a conversation with him when I was 18. And I caught him in a good mood and he accepted me to send him some, uh, some items, uh, one of them a cassette of my band and was transcriptions uh, that I did. And when, he, when I spoke to him after that, he said he listened to the tape and he liked it and he wanted to audition me for the band. I told him I was 18 and he said, forget it. <laughs> but uh, he hired me to transcribe. And I transcribed for a couple of years until I, a day after my 20th birthday. And I moved out to California, right down the street from his house, and started going up the house. And he um, had me doing recordings. And then he uh, invited me to audition at rehearsals. And I got the audition in 1980 and did the fall tour. It was kind of amazing. And I toured with him in 80, 81, and 82. And uh, you know, the biggest takeaway from me with Frank was uh, he was such a free thinker. You know, he, he was an explosion of freedom. If he wanted to do something, he just did it. He didn't depend on anybody else to do it for him. And uh, he didn't allow obstacles to deter his musical intentions. He just did it. No, no excuses. He didn't give excuses. So I just thought, you know, when I started to become independent, a musician that that's what you do if you want to do something do it and that's it the end you just do it if, if somebody isn't a cooperative component you figure out another way that's it anything else is an excuse one time we were recording in the studio and uh, there was a uh, everybody was recording and Frank was in the control room and I'm in the control room and uh, there's a spider on the floor. This big spider just comes walking in. And, and Frank goes, stop, stop, stop. He stops the whole session. And he gets up and he walks over to the spider and he picks it up. And he walks across the studio and he opens the door. He walks through the hall. He opens the door to the outside. He puts the spider down on the ground outside, shuts the door, walks through the hall, walks into the studio, shuts the door, walks through the studio, sits down and goes, okay, now we can continue. And I, I said, uh, you know, it's a, okay, and we play. And then after that, I said, Frank, wh you know, why didn't you just kill the spider? You know, that's what most people would have done. And Frank said, I know some spiders that have more of a right to live than some humans. <laughs> there, was, there, was some, there was five things every day that I could tell you you know, that would make you laugh. I um, am so lucky because I do get to work with a lot of great people. And through the years, um, even when I started my solo career and I started to record uh, Flexible, I, I, I was able to work with a lot of great people, you know. And then um, soon after that, I was involved in the movie Crossroads. And I was with a, a, and worked with great people. I was in a band called Alcatraz, worked with really great people. And then I joined David Lee Roth's band, and Dave was another mentor of mine. You know, no matter how you slice it up, he, he was intense, he was brilliant, and he was the quintessential rock star. And he knew how to command an audience. So that was a, a great um, experience. You know, I became kind of a rock star overnight. Uh, and then um, I joined the band Whitesnake, worked with really great people, you know, and all along the way, I mean, I can't, you know, you go to Wikipedia or something, I don't know, you know, you can see it all, I, 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 I lose track. <laughs> Next thing you know, I, you know, I get in here, Steve, we want to play on one of our records, you know? And um, 
and that happened, and I really enjoyed it. I made a vi I made, I was in their video, Polyphia, a song called Ego Death. <laughs> And that's the kind of thing I like to do because my style is so different uh, than a lot of the new generation. But uh, they um, had me, you know, I contributed and it turned out pretty cool. Very, I like the balance of the way my, my style works over their style. You know, I'm more like this and they keep this going, you know. But um, I kind of keep my eye out for interesting collaborations, although I don't seek them out, and I'm not so eager to do them, uh, usually. Unless, I mean, the Polyphia one I was. Only because I, I just feel, um, you know, with the amount of time I have left, I just want to continue to create a catalog of music that's undiluted by anybody else's contribution. To hear more of this interview, visit our podcast, Life Minute TV, on iTunes and all streaming podcast platforms.